Today, I'm going to talk to you about grief. We're going to have a conversation about the end of the world as you know it and the pain and sadness that comes from this loss. Still, I promise you that this is going to be a story of hope about the world that comes after and the messy joy of finding purpose for a future in crisis. And unfortunately, I have to start with some bad news. The world you know is ending. That world was built on extracting and burning fossil fuels. Just look around you. The chairs we're sitting on, the clothes we're wearing, even what we're going to have for lunch today, everything in our lives depends on cheap, abundant energy for anything from its production to disposal. And today, 70% of the energy we use on this planet comes from fossil fuels. Now, there are two main problems with fossil fuels. The first, as you know, it's highly polluting. It's not just the leading cause of climate change, it's also really bad for people's lungs and a leading cause of mortality worldwide. Secondly, fossil fuels are not renewable. That means on a human time scale, once we've used them up, they're gone. We haven't actually found a substitute energy with quite the firepower of gasoline, and that is running out. We are just about holding steady by digging deeper into more difficult extraction sites, but those supplies are not going to last forever. I have some more bad news. There aren't enough metals and minerals on the planet to power a green revolution for everybody. Let me give you an example. If an average-sized European country like France or Spain was to change all of its uh, petrol cars over to electric vehicles overnight, they would be using 20% of the world's copper supply. The conclusion is clear. Regardless of what happens with climate change, we cannot maintain our current lifestyles. Green growth is a dream for techno-optimists with no basis in real-world physics. And then there's the time factor. Every year that we wait for a technological miracle to solve our problems is a year those problems get worse. We are already paying the price of inaction now at 1.2 degrees of warming. I mean, just look at the past year alone. We're breaking heat records, not just in summer, but also in winter now. While well, we have a mega drought in the US and in Europe, and at the same time, countrywide floods in Pakistan. And while this is happening, life on Earth is collapsing. The latest Living Planet report shows that 70% of the animals on this planet have disappeared since the 1970s. That is a 10% increase since the last report was published four years ago. The pace of human-induced destruction is breathtaking. We have launched the sixth mass extinction. We are barreling towards 1.5 degrees of warming with no plants currently compatible with holding warming below two degrees. We are not ready for what comes next. There will be heat waves breaching 50 degrees Celsius all over the planet. It's going to be the collapse of entire ecosystems, the death of the oceans. There will be mega fires and we won't have water to put them out. And at the same time, floods and hurricanes are going to tear down cities. Millions, if not billions of people are going to lose their homes. And they are going to come knocking on the borders of resource constrained and climate afflicted countries they will have hunger in their belly and children in their arms, and we are going to have to face all of this while going through the worst energy crunch in human history. Economies are going to be devastated, supply chains are going to go belly up, and industries will collapse. So brace yourselves. This is not going to be a peaceful transition. It's going to be a 5,000-foot nosedive during in-flight dinner, and half of the passengers are not wearing seatbelts. But here's the thing, we can still land the plane and save the lives of the people on board. It's not going to be pleasant, but a 1.5 degree emergency landing is still technically possible. Beyond that, we risk triggering tipping points that push the planet 
towards a hothouse earth state that is hostile to most forms of life. This could turn into a crash landing with no survivors. So you'd think we'd be throwing everything that we have at this, right? Why are we so terrible at reacting? I think that humanity is trapped in a cycle of unresolved mourning. We are spinning through the stages of grief without finding closure. Let's start with denial. We have known since at least the 1972 Meadows report that infinite growth was not possible on a finite planet, just like we've known beyond doubt since the 1960s that the climate was warming. Of course, the fossil fuel industry deserves its fair share of blame for deliberately spreading doubt about the scientific consensus. But really, you and I have to admit that we didn't and we still don't want to believe the science. That is because believing the science means we have to fundamentally rethink all of our markers of success. We cannot have the nice big suburban house, the SUV, flights all over the world, meet for every dinner like our parents had. That hurts and it feels unfair because we are profoundly attached to our ways of living. You see, we grew up believing that deeply unsustainable practices were the baseline normality. Now, our identities are bound up with this warped sense of normal. But have a think about it. The past 50 years really were an aberration in human history. And now history is catching up with us, but we prefer to deny science than to change who we are to meet this moment. And while we bury our heads in the sand, climate change and biodiversity loss are already taking our childhoods away from us. When you realize you will never be able to teach your children to skate on natural ice, that they will seldom know the joys of a white winter wonderland, and half of the animals in the picture books exist only in zoos. That hurts in a place so deep, you cannot speak its name. So, in a way, denial protects us from pain. But as life on Earth unravels, we cannot suppress reality anymore. And so, we become angry. We lash out and find someone to blame. Call out the politicians who chose their next election over the future of humanity. Call out companies that engineer collapse for profit. Call out rich countries who pillage and plunder and leave so little for everyone else. Rage and rightly so. But then have a think about who elects the politicians, who buys the products these companies are selling, and who sitting in this room today is benefiting from the plundering. And then you might turn to your next strategy. Bargaining. And boy, are we bargaining for our lives. We elevate cowboy billionaires to the status of demigods if they will only promise us a little while longer that they can solve all of our problems with a dusting of techno magic. We want to believe so hard that if we just cover the rooftops in solar panels, cycle to work and recycle our plastics, life can just carry on as it is. We drive hard bargains with ourselves and tell me if this sounds familiar. I'm going to book a flight to Tokyo and then I promise to go vegan for a year. Uh, actually, that's a bit much, isn't it? How about vegetarian? All right, six months vegetarian, Sundays don't count, that's a deal. Until you realize that no amount of rocket ships that billionaires send into space are going to prevent the collapse of the energy grid or the food supply chain. And then you fall into a depression. You feel like it's hopeless, like there's nothing to do but lie down and wait out the apocalypse. I have to admit that of the five stages of grief, despair hit me the hardest. When I realized the extent of our problems, I fell into a two year long climate depression and I experienced anxiety attacks for the first time in my life. Picture this. I remember standing in the metro on my way home from work 
and feeling like there was a sinkhole opening beneath my feet. I looked around me, had the beautiful social order, and mused about the assumption that trains run on time, that they carry well-fed, healthy individuals to and from work. And then I thought about the millions of pipes carrying clean water into homes and the wires that keep the lights turned on. And then I thought about the trucks that go in and out of cities every day, carrying food that's been grown out of season in greenhouses with artificial fertilizers. And I looked up at the planes in the sky and I realized none of this can go on. I am going to live to see the end of this world, and I am afraid of the world that comes next. So, what's next? Because according to the textbooks, the next stage of grief is acceptance. But our textbooks were built on the experiences of dying patients. Their fate is pretty much sealed. Ours is not. We can still change the outcome. And I worry that if we get stuck in a cycle of unresolved grief, we risk passively accepting the worst instead of fighting for the best, even if the best is a tragedy compared to what we've had. So I'm going to tell you how I beat the depression and got back into the fight. The first thing I did was to treat my breakdown as an existential crisis. I realized that climate fears were connected to deeper concerns about living and dying in the grand scheme of the universe. You see, we humans have always had difficulties reckoning with death. In the past 50 years, our solution has been to simply deny its existence. Death is something that happens on hospital wards, out of sight, out of mind, except for relatives of the dying who have to then face their grief alone. Meanwhile, the rest of us try to cheat death. Nowadays, people with money can get their bodies cryo-frozen. The rest of us have to do, make do with more uh, metaphoric immortality, like having children, building companies, writing books, giving TEDx talks, compulsively posting on social media, anything to give us the illusion that our memory can carry on after we're gone. And now, Collapse threatens to sweep away our carefully crafted mausoleums like matchstick castles. So enter climate change and scorch the land, burn the forest, flood the cities, and take with it our delusions of immortality. A couple hundred years from now, if there are people left on this planet, they are going to be too busy surviving to remember us, all eight billion of us. So you and I have to face the fact that our existence with the richness of our inner lives, our traumas, our fears, our joys, our accomplishments, all of this is going to be wiped away and forgotten in the coming chaos. So really, collapse confronts us with our darkest fears. Finitude. That's heavy. Where do we go from here? You see, I think that Modern civilization delivered much of humanity from want and squalor, but in doing so, it has deprived us of two things that make human lives meaningful, something to fight for and someone to fight for it with. We have let ourselves be so anesthetized by comfort that we've lost both, and then we try and fill the void with meaningless objects and Instagramable experiences and then we still end up feeling more hollow. So perhaps the end of the world you know, as tragic as it is, is an opportunity to build a new world, a fairer world that's maybe more respectful of human bodies, nature, and each other. And we cannot have immortality or eternal economic growth, but we can still build worlds worth living with intent. And if collapse is coming, we don't have to face it alone. It's not going to be easy because individualism and inertia push us towards a dog-eat-dog -dog world of death and destruction. But isn't it a struggle worth striving for? And one I think we can collectively win. What does this all actually mean? For me, I think it means we have to build and commit to imperfect solidarities. 
We're simply out of time to wait for perfect opportunities to act. We have to try something and we have to try it now. For me personally, it meant that I quit my academic research career and I have spent the past few years forging bonds of love and solidarity with communities here in Holland, in India, Zambia and Zimbabwe, places already hard hit by collapse. You see, I set myself the very peculiar mission of empowering women and girls from underprivileged communities using the very practical skills of self-protection and self-defense, as well as material support for education, food, and clothing. This started out as a project in Zimbabwe in 2015. It's now an international organization with dozens of volunteers helping hundreds of women fight for a better life, despite the chaos of collapse unfolding around them. Believe me, this is not easy. Some days I feel like I'm raising a hundred daughters all going through their teenage phase at the same time in the middle of a hurricane. The reason I can do this is because I am surrounded by larger than life women who have lived through so much they could easily have decided to sit this one out. And still they wade into the fray. Their work ethic is forged in hardship and tempered in sisterhood and put to work in lifting the oppressed. Driven by love, we find meaning in each other and in the messy joy of solidarity. Now, we're not going to solve climate change or biodiversity collapse, at least why not on our own, but we are starting conversations about the kinds of conversations we want to see flourish in the new world. And this is my answer to climate grief. When our love for what is still possible overcomes the pain and sadness we feel for what is lost, then new worlds worth living can be born. So I would like to close my talk with a poem that I wrote about the love that comes after the loss at the end of the world. Let world-lorn lovers race to start love's fires whose wild crimson embers billowing stoke, sublime braziers blowing towers of smoke at the end of the world. Let our children's laughter ring long after the trembling echoes smolder midnight black on the scattered ash piles of blind men's rack at the end of the world. If all is lost, let lost light the searching. Those left to seek dream realms of morning ache, the grief-worn longings between sleep and wake at the end of the world. But lost is fear's noose, not a fate sealed tight. So let children lead and lovers show us how to rage, laugh, Live, be this our dying vow, for the end of the world is what we make of it. Thank you.